Hi guys, this is Nadia Hilker. I'm playing Magna on The Walking Dead, and you guys are listening to The Walking Dead Talk Through. I hope you guys enjoy this podcast, and I'm sending you all my love. Bye! Hello, my name is Cassie McClincy. I play Lydia on The Walking Dead, and you're listening to The Walking Dead Talk Through. Yeah! Hey there guys, I'm Callan McAuliffe and you're listening to The Walking Dead Talk Through on Talk Through Media. Hey, I'm Lindsley Register and I play Lara on The Walking Dead. You're listening to The Walking Dead Talk Through on Talk Through Media. Hey, this is Ross Marquand and you're listening to The Walking Dead Talk Through. Awesome. <laughs> Hey, survivors, welcome to episode 146 of The Walking Dead Talk Through. I'm Kyle. And I'm LT. And I'm Brian. <laughs> Yay. We uh, are here again, all three of us. Yep. It's always good to be back like that. Uh, and I did not mention anything about tales, but we're getting ready to go into that. <laughs> so the, le- we- the least said, the better. <laughs> We will be covering The Walking Dead Season 11, Episode 18, titled A New Deal. But first, we are going to cover feedback for the episode that seems to be on everyone's mind (laughs) of Tales of the Walking Dead, Season 1, Episode 6, LaDonna. It was written by Lindsay of, is that Valeril? 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 Valeril, yeah. And directed by Deborah Kempmeyer. Description on AMC+. Plus. Uh, it was a couple seeks refuge in a secluded house until it takes an emotional and psychological toll. All right. Well, I guess, do you want to just kind of start off, <laughs> Brian? Because <laughs> cause I know you love this episode. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, give me, give me a minute. Why don't, LT, why don't you go first? Well... The first thing I have to say is that once again, we seem to be in this rut that we're in somebody's graduate school film project. It didn't feel like The Walking Dead, even though there were eventually zombies. Um, The zombies were more of a parsley garnish than the actual entree. And... I will give them credit for this. And this is this is where I struggled with part of this because if they had taken a squeegee and wiped the whiteboard off and said this was not Tales of the Walking Dead, I could have bought it a lot better as a standalone horror show. Yeah, I agree. It was it was very much a a scary horror show. It just wasn't the walking dead from all the things that happened in it. You know, I could almost do the, this is a, you know, is it a horror film? Is it just that somehow the couple was subsumed with guilt for killing the old lady and they're, Guilt and their subconscious is what drove them to acts of madness. It's quite possible, yes. But is it Walking Dead? No. No. Just the fact that you have one or two zombies make an appearance just so that we can go, see, see, we had zombies. Yeah. There were far more tiny, crawling, metallic Jesuses than there were zombies in this show. That's the thing. If I was just looking at this as a horror show, I would probably go seven ish. But the fact that this is supposed to be a walking dead show, then they're not going to get any, you know, big points from me on that. Because like I said, it's, it's just like if I go to the grocery store and I pick up a box of lucky charms and I get home and I open the box and pull out the bag 
and have a box of Raisin Bran, <laughs> that's not Lucky Charms. That's Raisin Bran. If I'd have wanted Raisin Bran, I'd have bought Raisin Bran. But no, I want small sugar-coated things and marshmallows in my bowl with my milk. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be generous and go like two, three only because I'm butthurt about it not really being a zombie story. Hmm. Now, if you want to say, if you wanted to, to, you know, put duct tape over the check engine light and say, Oh, it's a horror movie. I might go seven ish, eight ish, but I'm sorry. If you're going to market it as a walking dead show, it needs to have something to do with the walking dead. Well, that's going to make me kind of look at it differently i'm glad that you um went first because uh you were more eloquent in what you said um i am going to be more um well when it comes to this episode play the sound effect please hate it (laughs) and that's not with two snaps up and a wiggle either (laughs) i i thought this was terrible. The worst episode within the universe. Um, and for the very reasons that you mentioned LT, um, it was just, it, it was fine, you know, like as a horror episode, as like a horror anthology, you know, if this was like, um, you know, the revival of night gallery or something like that. Um, yeah. That would be fine, you know. Um, it it was a it was a fine episode as horror goes, but as a as a zombie show, no, definitely not. And as a as a Walking Dead episode or Walking Dead universe episode, absolutely not. I mean, there was just there was so little that had to do with, um. The Walking Dead, and uh, just you know, I like the beginning of it. The very first, you know, the the first thirty seconds of the cold open when they're going up that hill, that was the best zombie part of the whole episode. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't mind the the characters in it. I I I thought it was a departure. But if I'm going to give this a rating based on the same kind of things that that um. You said LT. I would probably give this a two, and um, and I've never ever rated any episode of the Walking Dead universe as a two before, and it's largely like I say it. There are certain things that I could say that I don't want to say um, because it felt like I don't know. It just it felt like. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't feel brave enough to say what I really want to say, but, but it just, it had a certain flavor to the episode that to me did not feel walking dead to me. It felt more like, I'll just say the one word that'll get enough, um, skirn, you know, enough people, you know, can give me the side eye. It felt like representation to me. There, I said it. I said it. <laughs> hmm. if, it reminded me of the time at the Abigail Ranch and not because of, you know, it was largely Hispanic. It was, uh, that's not what I'm talking about here. Exactly. It was, it, it was that whole religious kind of like, you know, Santa Maria kind of thing. Hmm. Um that to me doesn't feel walking dead to me that that's that would be fine if they were starting a new zombie show that had some kind of ties to you know that whole you know voodoo santa maria kind of thing i i'd buy that for that but based on the walking dead universe this did not work for me at all it just mm. i was very very disappointed in it almost from the beginning yeah. So, and I, I was just going to wait for you to say that. So I was going to say that is an incredibly 
That's incredibly a harsh take on Abigail Ranch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. I, and but but I agree with you in that and you said night gallery and that that kind of rang a bell. You know, night gallery, maybe even American horror story or some other more pure horror genre show. Yes. Yeah. But I think all of us agree that it's just not Walking Dead. Yeah. It like I say, it's the flavor of, of it. Like, it's almost like to me, you know, if if we were talking vampires uh, or, you know, something like the strain, those kind of like vampire zombie like creatures, they could almost fit into this, you know, yeah. with a religious tone. But within The Walking Dead, to me, they stretched the, the concept uh, too far and it just didn't work for me at all. Mm. So. That's 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 it. I think I've I think I've <laughs> I I said one yeah. word that I didn't want to say, and please, I hope I didn't offend anybody by saying representation, because that anyway, that's what it felt like. I, yeah, I I don't know what else to say. I, I just don't I don't know what else to say. How else to say it? Yeah. But, well, I mean, I have not seen it. I only got through like the very initial beginning when they were like walked up to the you know like walked up the hill or whatever but i mean from what like listeners have like commented on that we'll be we'll start you know we'll go through you know i'm like I i'm going to watch it again just because i haven't seen it but it is going to be interesting to be like oh if i take this into a different like if i have a different mindset that i'm not watching the walking dead that i'm just watching a show you know a horror show you know then how will it you know how will that play out since I have not seen that, you know, I'll just see how that really plays. I and, think, and you know, the funny thing, I'll just interrupt you for a second. There are parts of the episode where I could almost drop the walking dead universe. And when, um, we got to those points, I started to enjoy it a little bit more, mm -hmm. you know, it's like kind of have to change your mindset, but then, then they bring the zombies back and then it would be like, I just can't, Huh. I can't deal with it. Just didn't work for me yeah. at all. Well, so. and this is like I just kind of it just popped in my head as you guys were talking. Though it's like it is kind of make me wonder. Then like, okay, well, we have how many executive producers on basically the Walking Dead universe, and like Robert Kirkman is one of them. Gail and Heard is one of them. You know, it's kind of like. Was this even something that they were even a part of, even though they are put on as, you know, in the credits and stuff like that to, um, you know, it's like you would think that there would be some kind of cohesion about like, oh, yeah, yeah, we need, you know, we have our universe. We need to kind of keep canon to like, oh, are they making tales of just like, oh, this is just like anybody can just have a, a, a play with it and do whatever they want, you know? Well, Gimple, and, Gimple was heavily involved in this like he he was he um worked on it with um the showrunner channing powell and yeah you know it's worth saying that i would say of the six episodes three or four of them were decent and and uh, i would even say you know a couple of them were really good the the um the uh alpha one i thought was excellent you know yeah uh, yeah and so it wasn't a question of them not doing good work on this, but maybe the biggest problem with this episode was they tried to push the boundaries a little bit too far. Yeah. And just, and, and as a result, it didn't work. Yeah. Well, hopefully they learn from that because, well, I was going to use a word that I, think that we all could agree to in some degree is the word filler <laughs> yep that, yeah but it's different it, it's it's um why would you make filler the last episode of this of the uh season yeah yeah well i'm just saying is that this was something that somebody said well we need we need to cover six weeks what can we do to cover six weeks and try to, you know, get some interest up and keep everybody in the mood for Walking Dead? And 
had they gone for more of a short tracks angle, even as much as some of those stories were kind of a departure from what we were expecting, we didn't quite get this level of not in the groove. Right. I would agree with that. Mm-hmm. I mean, the two animated episodes were probably the most departure, but then right now we have now we have Prodigy, which is kind of went in the same direction. And um, no, I'm just saying no. that I think somebody had an idea that let's let's do something different, and it turns out that you know maybe they went too far off the reservation this time. Yeah, which is what the you know. It- that that can happen and will happen when they're trying new things and just maybe they'll start you know because if this is going to go on for multiple seasons which we don't know which they could totally just not do it but you know if they bring this back next summer then maybe they you know they will stick to kind of like <laughs> what is going to be their cash cow is like what well, the fans want to see is you know our old heroes or villains, you know, and like more backstory. So I guess we'll see. Yep. All right. Well, if that is all that you guys have to add, I'm assuming, um, let's go into our listeners, uh, uh, ratings and feedback. And the first is our ratings. And for this episode, uh, Dieta from Detroit gave it a six out of 10. This is not your house. Get out. <laughs> And I stole this one specifically, Glennis. I want you to know. Glennis from Toronto gives it five out of ten. It's passed on. This parrot is no more. He's bereft of life. He is shoveled off and joined the choir invisible. He has ceased to be. It's an ex parrot. <laughs> And I had to do that because that is one of my favorite Monty Python sketches ever. <laughs> uh, you did such a good, yeah, you definitely needed to do that. Not He's me. got beautiful plumage. <laughs> uh, best ever. Uh, Renee from Fairburn, is this a typo? Wow. Okay. Renee disagrees with us. Uh, she gives it a 10 out of 10. I would rather... I would have rather taken my chances with the sleepwalkers than to stay in that haunted house. Smiley face, smiley face. <laughs> Those are shocked faces, sir. I can't they have, tell. They got big <laughs> eyes. Okay, that's it. That's it. I'm going to 150%. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, it doesn't look it doesn't look like a smiley. All right. Uh I think Renee is like on the same kind of line of this. But I, I think we'll go on when she gets her awesome sauce. So n- not surprising that she's giving it this. Okay. Rating. Okay. All right. All right. Well, Mike from Asheville gave it a two out of 10 as an episode in the walking dead world and a seven out of 10 as a horror anthology TV show. See me and Mike right there. <laughs> And finally, we have Ivan from Minnesota who says, a point eight out of ten. I couldn't give it a one because it was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> ouch. Ouch. Uh, all right. Well, that goes uh, into our awesome sauce. Uh, so our first awesome sauce comes from Dieta from Detroit. And she says, the creepy, sc- scary stuff throughout the episode. Seeing the lady in the shadows pop out gave me a jump. The voices and the crucifix coming alive just added to the scene. And then that's a, like a scared face emoji. Yep. And Glennis from Toronto says, creepy, crawly Jesuses. And she has a grin after that. And that's one of the things that I had talked about. All the, all the little tiny Jesuses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. The, the uh, animated Jesuses. I uh, I was going to say that one thing I did like was how the picture kept changing. I mm-hmm. thought that was, was good. Um, Renee from Fairburn says, I'm a horror movie fanatic, so this was right up my alley. This was so good to me. It reminded me of the episode with Connie and the guy that locked Michonne up on the island. Hmm. Nice. Um, all right. Well, then Mike from Asheville is our last one. And he says, the mystery of it all. 
crawling Jesus, being raised a Catholic and then turning against it as a teen, I like horror based around religion, especially ones that push the limit. I've never seen anything like that, and it makes a cool visual. All the visuals, dark setting, lit candles, crucifix it, that damn parrot. Yeah, I'm going to have to definitely watch this and you you definitely know, take, wa- take yeah. it from the standpoint of like, yes, don't think about Walking Dead and just like watch it as like a, you know, a scary movie, you know. Maybe I'll report back. Yep. I think you should take the time um, and and do how you do it where you, you're watching it on your iPad while you're having your bubble bath. <laughs> <laughs> Since you shared that this week to me. Um, and, and, just, and just watch it and um, try to keep an open mind. And hopefully you'll... When you get scared and drop yeah. your iPod in the water. No, if it sits far enough away that I don't, but yeah, I, I don't have to touch it. <laughs> it's, it'll be safe. Uh, yes, I do. I watch. I, it hasn't been. It's been a long time, but like now that like life is starting to get back to normal, I'm like, okay, I can finally take my baths and watch my shows. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Mike, and everyone else. That was all the awesome. So let's go into our weeks. Uh, the week sauce, the first one comes from Glenn's from Toronto, and she says, This episode doesn't really belong in Tales of the Walking Dead. This last episode could have been so much more. For example, if you could have been about a past or existing characters already in the Walking Dead universe, or about a one-off story which could have been fleshed out a bit further. Like that Red Machete web episode where the story was told of how the Red Machete landed in the hands of Rick Grimes. There you go. Couldn't agree more. Mike from Asheville says, I felt the writing wasn't great. Could have been fleshed out more for this story. Seems to have been able to tighten up and give a little background. Uh, all right, well, that was all the week, so let's go into the what. Um, Renee from Fairburn gives it, and she called it the what the hell sauce. She's like, who in the right mind would have even thought about staying in that house with all the creepy stuff on the walls and the drapes look like she never opened them? Not to mention the lady was giving Jeepers Creepers vibes and then they had the audacity to sleep in her bed. Face palm, face palm. I think not. They wanted to die. She said, shrug, shrug, and then angry face, angry face. And we've got Mike from Asheville and he says, how did the witch lady die? I think... It was when she conked her head on the end of the table, sir. <laughs> yeah. A little a little subcranial hematoma action. And he goes, who is Maria? Was it a haunting? What did she smell when she walked back in towards the end after yelling outside that it was their house now? She acted like something was burning or some type of strong smell took over the house. Was the basement an illusion, or did Witch Lady really trap people down there? It's best not to think about it. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> that, that may be a rabbit hole you don't want to go down. <laughs> and to that end, Ivan from Minnesota says, What did I just watch? This wasn't even close to The Walking Dead. and was straight up supernatural horror. Waste of 40 minutes of my life with... Uh, yeah, I don't know if that's the meh face or just yeah, not happy. Just, just a not happy face. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ivan. Uh, right. Well, then that goes into our sad sauce. And we only got the one from Renee from Fairburn. She said, poor little parrot. She's like, cry face, cry face. So I guess the parrot dies. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, we had our one, oh, hell no, from Ivan from Minnesota. Who says, tiny crawling metal Jesuses, blood dripping from the walls, ghosts, and the whole house being possessed and haunted? What are we doing? (laughs) AMC, get your crap figured out. (laughs) And he follows it up with a cussy face emoji. (laughs) Uh, Nice. All right. Well, then that leads us into our feedback for this episode. Um, So Dieta from Detroit starts it off. She says this episode had all the horror story feels of a good scary movie on Halloween night. I like how it incorporated the walkers into the horror theme, probably because I love all things horror. I do agree with Mike Rollo and Glennis as it was not the walking dead we are used to. It was definitely a good horror anthology theme, though. I agree we needed more depth of a story for LaDonna than what they gave us in the 45 minutes. It 
it's we're a mini series where we get more episodes to help understand the story more, it would have probably made more sense. But overall, it was an okay episode. Uh, she goes on, she says, so for my understanding, the longer they stayed in the house, the more it played with their mind until they eventually turned on each other. Then the house adds them to the collection of lost souls who also try to uh, claim the house of horrors. I know I would have have stayed there after watching the old lady die than seeing all that creepy stuff. Nope, I'll take my chances with the dead dead. <laughs> Rolling on four, laughing, and then shrugs. Uh, and then, oh yeah, did anybody else think Eric looked like he could have been Shane's son or a younger version of Shane? Um, he even sounded like him. I kept looking at it first glance, thought that they brought John um, Brennenthal back for a guest appearance. And then she's like, is that the rolling on the floor? Yeah, rolling on the floor laughing or just tears in the eyes with a big smiley face. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, next. And it's Glenn. It's from Toronto. She said, did that soup or whatever they were offered in that spooky house have some magic mushrooms added? As it was only after eating that that the hallucinations began. This episode was more along the lines of that creep show horror series directed by Greg Nicotero or Shudder that I've watched a year or two ago. Eric didn't feel any guilt in accidentally killing LaDonna Alma. He had also killed Maria by mistake, too, when they were out on the road, but just brushed it all off and carried on as if nothing had happened. His girlfriend, Adalia, though, was feeling all the guilt and trying to quell the evil spirits by praying. And Eric, her boyfriend, managed to kill the parrot, too, also accidentally, when he was trying to silence his mutterings of, what did you do, etc. He had a few anger issues, which had resulted in a few deaths. I really wonder if it was both their imaginations or hallucinations and none of it was real or they'd both be driven crazy by being drugged and their feelings of guilt or it was really the supernatural getting back at them for being murdered by Eric. (laughs) Renee from Fairburn. She says, this episode was really good to me, but I'm so happy The Walking Dead is getting ready to come back on. It's back. It's back. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> please, please don't bring Tails back. <laughs> I preferred WB over this. World Beyond. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Peace and love. Peace, peace, peace emojis. Talk to you guys in a couple of weeks. Well, you're talking to us now. But <laughs> that's the magic of a late episode. <laughs> a late half episode. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Well, next comes from Mike from Asheville. And he says, this was a disappointing episode for being the final episode of the series. Something more based around known characters or even going back to the first day of the outbreak. Or at very least, make D the final episode. The concept was fine. There was some good stuff in this episode. Um, an idea that could have been better. Overall, I didn't hate the series. I had complaints, but to see something fresh on TV is always good. Out of the shows that air on Sundays, I've been more excited about House of Dragons. Tales was just a secondary show that filled some time. But I'm okay if they want to do a season two and just treat it as a horror anthology. If there are zombies, great. If not, fine. Just give us good writing. I would hope that they would go towards... Like, you know, what they did with the D episode. It's just like, you know, start expanding the universe, filling in some gaps. It doesn't even have to necessarily be about, you know, our original characters or just, you know, characters that we have already, you know, know and love. But, like, still stay in the universe. I think that's, I mean, that's that, to me, it was what I thought the whole point of what this whole series was supposed to be about. Kind of like the webisodes, you know, where it was just like, oh, we get little cool little, you know, tidbits here and there. But it's, you know, like with the bicycle girl or like, you know, even the sub, you know, like all those webisodes. It's just stick to that. (laughs) All right. Next. Minnesota says, look, I get trying new things and I was willing to give episode two the benefit of the doubt, but this was too much. This episode was pointless, and it doesn't belong in The Walking Dead, period. Why can't we get tales about previous characters, different walkers like Tank Walker, Well Walker, etc., or the early days of the apocalypse around the world? 
This whole season, besides D, was just okay or bad. It'd be sick to see Ezekiel's early days, or Negan forming the Saviors, or Terminus first becoming Terminus, or a live-action series on Clementine. There is just so much interesting content they could make, but they wasted on garbage like this episode and Fear Season 4 through 7 and most of World Beyond. I love The Walking Dead, but they are really making it really hard to continue to support their content with stuff like this. Love the podcast. Keep up the great work. And I can't wait for season 11C. Yeah. Uh, clap, 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 clap. Thanks, Ivan. Um, yep. I couldn't agree more. I think all those examples you gave would be so much better. I would love to be able to see how Terminus started, you know, and how Negan formed the saviors. And, you know, I de- definitely see that some of the, you know, there's some of the things that they would have to, you know, overcome would be the actors' contracts and how much money they're paying them. You know, like, it's like there's going to be, you know, I'm sure they paid all, uh, like, uh, all the actors that they got for this run, you know, they probably didn't, they probably worked something out to, you know, it's not like they were paying them millions and millions of dollars just to, you know, star in one episode, you know, it's like they probably, hey, you guys are fans, hey, come do this, you know, and come over and you'll be a part of it, and, you know, I, that was my, they, they, they pitched it to them in some way that I'm sure that they wanted to do it without really having to pay tons for it. So we'll see. See if it gets better. All right. Well, I fear, not fear, I feel that we should just move on to what everybody wants to hear. Yes. Yeah, so let's <laughs> talk about an actually good episode. Yes. <laughs> All right. The Walking Dead Season 11, Episode 18, titled A New Deal. Story by Corey Reed and Telplay by Corey Reed and Kevin Dybolt. Directed by Jeffrey F. January, and the description on AMC Plus is, Our survivors make a deal with Pamela for a clean slate. The Commonwealth celebrates Founders Day. Yay! All right, well, let's go into our ratings. Uh, I will give... Um, I had some struggles trying to get another rewatch in this, but I mean, I totally love this episode. Um, I just, I'm loving The Walking Dead being back, and I'm loving the pace that they're going. And so things just keep building and it's enjoyable. So I will give this a nine and I don't really have anything else to say with it, but I'll just give it a good nine. (laughs) I'm giving it a 9.8 out of 10. Hornsby gets ants in his pants and Sebastian gets a permahickey. Yeah, he does, doesn't he? Yep. (laughs) And I'm going to give this one a high rating of 9.7 one of the things i definitely paid attention to during this episode 9.7 we were talking about this last night before we recorded um the episode for um episode 17 and uh we taught we decided that it was incestuous looking so Kyle and I said. So I'm going to call this 9.7 incestuous hand brushing exchanges. And I think all of you know what I'm talking about here. Yes, they should, because it was very prominent. (laughs) Like it's how they played that. Um, It's interesting. All right. Well, that goes into our listeners' ratings, and I'll start off with Dieta from Detroit, and she gave it a 9 out of 10. Just stop. Another great episode. (laughs) Glenn from Toronto says, 8 out of 10, Daryl Mike knife drops. Renee from Fairburn gives it 10 out of 10. Ding dong, Sebastian's dead. Hug, hug, hug emojis. (laughs) And I think he died in a way that I think most of us would have been fine with. I know. Remember, mm-hmm. yes. in the beginning, everybody was like, gosh, I hope he gets it. I hope he gets this. Well, now we got to see it. Yes. <laughs> and it was to, glorious. To quote, to quote Ruthie from a couple of days ago, what she said, and I had to agree with her when she said it, um, she said that it was a very satisfying uh, episode. And, uh, <laughs> And yes, I would agree. It was a very satisfying 
episode, especially yep. the end. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, Mike from Asheville gave it a nine out of ten. Wrestling, okay. Dot dot dot. <laughs> Not the first time we've seen wrestling on The Walking Dead uh, or or related episodes or shows because we've seen it. We've seen it before. Salt and fear. We've seen it. In, um, seen it at. Uh, uh, we saw uh, it at Woodbury. Woodbury. We, Woodbury. Woodbury. Mm-hmm. I said Woodbury. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Woodbury. We've seen it at Woodbury. We've seen it uh, with um, uh, and on fear with. Yep. Um, the care with um, Dwight, Sherry, and what was her name? Mickey. 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 Yes. So it's not the first time we've seen it. No. Nope. Don't know what what place it, there is for it, but anyway. Well, this was definitely a very, like, this was not, this was different in the t- sense of, like, this was like watching WWE. And so it's like, okay, these, the, the people are, you know, there's not walkers on the corners, you know, trying to bite them. You know, it was more of like the entertaining and this and that. But it was just, it was interesting to see because it was kind of like they were so into it. And for me, I'm not a wrestling fan. <laughs> so I kind of was like, oh, okay. So I guess this is your guys' entertainment. Get it, whatever. But they were so into it. <laughs> and oh, it's propaganda, really is what it was yeah because it was captain commonwealth i just want to know what the other guy he was throwing around yes was. captain commonwealth yeah uh, i don't know who the other yeah. person was mr crm <laughs> <laughs> well that would be giving too much information yeah. because yes well i have something to say about that i have something to say about that later okay mr outside the wall guy <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, next Oh, I guess it'd be Ivan from Minnesota says seven out of ten. Sebastian's military combat skills were on full display. And Emma from the UK, welcome back, girl. Uh, seven out of ten. Don't worry, he'll live. <clears throat> nice. Uh, glad to have you back, Emma. I know I don't. Yeah, you know, she, she. I was figuring like she was catching up with tales, but. No need to really leave any comments on that, because unless you want to, Emma, <laughs> we'll just get onto the main show. Glad you're back. Yes, Emma. Um, just just skip to <laughs> <laughs> just stick with the main show. <laughs> you, you know, you, if you must, if you must watch one, I would say go and watch the one that has Alpha in it, and then if you want to watch a second one, maybe go see the first one with uh, Terry Crews. And um, um, what's her name? Um, can't think of her first name. Mun. Oh, Olivia, Olivia Mun. Mun. Olivia Mun. Um, I thought that was a good episode. And um, maybe third would have been well, the 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 crazy one, the the Parker Posey one. Parker, yeah. And then maybe the Anthony Edwards one. Those would be the four. Stop at four. Just 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 <laughs> just don't bother with five and six. Just stop. You won't. You know, it's okay. <laughs> you don't you don't have to be a completist with this show. Yeah. Uh, so. All right. All right. Well, that takes us into our awesome sauce. Awesome sauce. And our first awesome comes from Dieta from Detroit, and she says, "Daryl and Judah scenes. The last scene with Judah asked for her father's gun to help eliminate the dead. Even after laying down her weapon for what she thought would be um, for good, she remembered her training and didn't miss a beat with her precision shooting skills, putting down two walkers with one shot each. Yeah, she's back. Daryl stabbing Hornsby, leaving him a reminder of who not to mess with. Definitely. And Glenn from Toronto says, Ah, that Colt Python in Judith's hands. Mm -hmm. Ivan from Minnesota says, Lance taking the fall, Smi- um, winking smiley face or side eye smiley face or I don't know what kind of. I'm just so I I literally need to take course in emojis. <laughs> I do. I it's it's like a thing. Anyway, <laughs> they look different on everything, so it's kind of like yeah, I don't I, I, always I know. know if it's the right one or not because it looks different yeah. on my phone. I mean, we need an we need an emojiologist. <laughs> Well, okay. What I'm seeing is I see a 
a smile that is um, bent to the right and kind of side eye. So anyway, Sebastian having zero filter and perfect timing to dig himself a grave and then meeting his demise in front of a very concerned crowd um, with a winking smiley face or winking smirking face. I don't know. I wish they would, you could just, I wish you could roll over an emoji and it would tell you what the F it is. You don't know how many times I keep doing that, thinking of the exact thing. And I'm like, oh no, it doesn't tell you that. <laughs> there's no. no, like there's no tool tip that pops up saying, this is what this is. <laughs> uh, anyways, thank you. I... I'll wait for my daughter to come home from fall break we can have somebody that's maybe under 30 to be our interpreter we're gonna have like literally like this key on the side of the dock that's gonna have all these emojis with what they are so we know oh my goodness all right i think i you know maybe maybe this is something that i should invest some time in and um teach myself what emojis mean and then write a book on it and you know <laughs> web designer What's that? Web designer? Yeah. <coughs> Web designer. Well, that's that's a you don't make <laughs> emojis for web design. That's just emojis. That's just a different thing. But anyway. Anyways, all right. To me, to me, if you're not if if you're not at least a millennial, you you can't understand what I mean half the time. So <laughs> all right. Well, anyway. yeah. Next is Emma from the UK, and she says, Daryl stabbing Hornsby hands down in the sewer. Some nice conversation between Daryl and Judith in the church. A couple of great actors, and I love their chemistry together. Yep, for sure. Stephanie, what a legend. Recording Sebastian and bring out, bringing out about his downfall. Seeing walkers let loose in the uh, Commonwealth. About time those guys got a taste of the world as it is now. Yeah, I like that too it's just i felt sad for the people that were dead <laughs> kind of was like uh hornsby and his henchmen uh just didn't like it uh and then she goes on and says no one helping sebastian despite his pleas and he finally gets his comeuppance could have couldn't have happened to a nicer chap <laughs> indeed nothing really weak or what or hell no this week and that was the end of her comments um yeah just overall good episode as always and thank you emma it's renee from fairburn who says let's start with daryl stabbing hornsby hug hug epic they show sure have daryl doing a lot of cussing lately shrug shrug yes i do daryl's talk with judith had me in my feelings and little rj is the cutest i'm not supposed to tell and then Sebastian getting set up by Eugene and his girlfriend and then getting chewed up by the zombies. <laughs> Mike from Asheville, he says, or he says, the stab. Thank you, Daryl. Yes, the stab. I love the stab, too. Carol making deals. Judith got her gun. Love seeing her stare down after shooting. Yeah. Daryl daddy. He's trying so hard. And then lastly. As we all have said, Sebastian fa finally gets it. What a baby. <laughs> One walker and all he could do was cry for help. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Ugh. Well, good riddance. He is good riddance gone indeed. For now. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for your awesome sauce. I just, because uh, I, like I said, I still wasn't able to really get like a full big rewatch. So I'm kind of limited in some of my comments tonight. But um, I do like I agree with most, you know, everybody what they've said. But yeah, that stab um, from Daryl and especially since it was in front of Pamela Milton. Like I, I love seeing that because it's just it it's almost kind of like it just keeps reinforcing the idea or like, you know, that Daryl like cannot he's not you know like basically it's like there is no one that can tame him <laughs> you know i'm sure pamela maybe or maybe mercer you know was just like oh like he's you know like i can somehow i can control him in some way or whatever you know but daryl is like he is his own you know he's a rick and basically 
But um, I love like, it's like he'll take any little chance he get. He knew that he he probably it crossed his mind thinking that like, oh, if I do this, you know, oh, something might happen, you know, to me, or like there might be some repercussions or whatever. But then at the same time, I think he also knows as like, oh yeah, but I know that Pamela doesn't really, you know, that she's not going to do anything and. I don't know. It just, it's just kind of like that middle finger and, <laughs> and that's, and that is so Daryl. So it's like, I don't know. That's my big, awesome. I loved seeing that. And I'm glad it happened at the very beginning. <laughs> All right. Well, who wants to go first with their awesome sauce? I do go for it. So, um, like everyone else has said, um, you know, seeing Sebastian die it was great. And I have to say, and you might have to bleep me, but I'll self bleep. Am I a sadistic <laughs> bleep? <laughs> I enjoyed watching him die and watching people watching him die. <laughs> so it wasn't just that I got pleasure from watching him die. I got pleasure from watching the people watching him die. <laughs> Oh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> it's not well. It's, he he it's, he does not. He did not deserve to live. He was not a. He was not a good person. Nope. Um. To that end, I will say that I loved Eugene's linebacker tackle of the Walker into Sebastian. That was uh, Pro Bowl style. Um. You know. Uh. Tackle. I thought. I thought that was. Uh, great that he did that and i could i could see it happening as it was about to happen and sebastian being such a troll to try to you know throw the the walker into um um stephanie or is it, no it's max right it's max it's max max yeah. it's not oh, yeah, stephanie max. it's max yeah. yeah um so you know out to and i'll just say it i won't say specifically but i guess sebastian has a different fate than he had in the comics now that doesn't he because um if you go back and and look to see what happened with sebastian in the comics he had a much different fate than uh this one this sebastian does uh i love seeing um daryl stabbing of hornsby's hand uh love that that was already talked about already um, I thought it was speaking back of, uh, Sebastian, I, I noticed on the last watch that I just did prior to us, uh, recording, um, that right at the end, as he's being devoured and all these people are watching him, you know, being killed or dead. Um, what do you hear over the, you know, over the speakers you're here, Sebastian continuing his rant. Oh Yeah. You know, so here he is in death, you know, telling telling the the citizens of the Commonwealth what how what he really thinks of them. Mm -hmm. And last and most importantly, um, I mentioned it in my rating, but what was going on with Hornsby and his reaction to Milton brushing her hand on his face? It was like it was incestuous. That's how I like. It was kind of like you know, um, Mama and and his and the you know boy yeah. wanting attention, but it all oh, it also seems sexual to me. Uh, yeah. that's uh, that's I what I thought. So so that's why I say incestuous because it it felt it felt incestuous. It felt like something you know freaky was going on. It, it, it felt more on a level of like, no, this isn't just like, Oh, someone like they're, they're close in the sense of like, they're close as like two separate people working together and some, you know, government, like uh, coworkers to being like, there's some history there and there's something that's very, yeah, it got the way she, what she was saying, like calling him a little boy, or like, you're just a boy. Like, you know, it was like a mom to her younger son, you know, like it just, yeah, it had that, feel to it for sure so hopefully I, I mean i would assume that we will find out <laughs> what well that is i kind of have a take on that go for it is 
I think that what we saw was the last bit of the dance that those two have been doing for some time that I'm thinking that Hornsby felt all empowered because he was thinking, well, you know, Pamela sees me as an equal and I'm going to be her, like her consort one day. And, you know, I'm going to be the man of the house and I'm going to, you know, take over and she'll see all these things that I've done for her, you know, and she'll love me, whether it's, you know, this weird Lannister thing going on or, you Mm -hmm. know, whatever it is. And I think part of that was the touch on the face was her pretty much saying, I'm sorry, Lance, I'm cutting you loose. It's not you, it's me. See, that's kind of what I took from it, that all this time they've been doing this little dance and he was getting all these ideas and he's doing all this stuff and she never saw him as an equal. And he's thinking that's his power play. You know, she likes me. She really likes me. And I'm one day, you know, I'm going to, you know, marry my yeah. teacher kind of thing. Hmm. You know, so that's kind of what I took from it. Um, One thing that I really liked was that little exchange between Mercer and Hornsby when he said, when he was talking about my men, he goes, are they your men? Yeah. Yeah. That was good. So Mercer kind of starts going, I'm kind of seeing, I'm beginning to see the forest in amongst the trees here. Um, I'm going to have to concur with all you guys and say, absolutely love the big stabaroo there. Um, and especially, you know, you know that Daryl wanted to, to just gut Hornsby. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that thing of, it's like, he'll live. And, you know, I think that Hornsby's going to do what Hornsby does, but I think that he's going to realize that, you know, you just don't screw around with Mama Dixon's baby boy. Right. That Daryl just does not play. And I think it reinforces the idea that he had that Hornsby realized that the Alexandrians needed to be dealt with because they were more than, you know, they were more than he could handle. Uh, Definitely going to go big, big awesome for the way that Max set Sebastian up. And the fact that she recorded over you know, Papa Milton's speech on that cassette tape. And I guarantee you, they don't have another copy of it somewhere. So, oh, you think so? I didn't even think oh, of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I do. And so I'm thinking. You don't think they a- just flipped the tape over or something? No, because you never saw her pop the tape. So to me, that's like a double screw you. Not only did she bring the house down, not only did she expose you know the Miltons for what they are, but she destroyed, you know, that valuable Founders Day speech that they probably played every year. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, yeah. So every year from now on, they'll have Sebastian yeah, speech. Sebastian. Yep. So the next thing is, I really like the fact that when, uh, you know, Pamela's in the wrestling ring and she's getting fruit salad, you know, and people are, you know, chucking all sorts of things at her that mercer was like you know i've got to go stop the walkers you know i've got to go fight the gate and she says you need to protect me he says i need to protect my people he's like you're on your own babe (laughs) and just her standing there getting pelted with tomatoes and lettuce and things i was going that just the look on her face realizing that you know things may have gotten out of hand And just like everybody else, I got to say it, watching Sebastian getting that hunk bit out of him, it it made me wince. It also reminded me of a certain other neck biting that I brought up when Rick took a big hunk out of the claimer when he was trying to mess with Carl. It just, it had that whole, you know, big bite when the walker had that big hunk of meat hanging out of its mouth. (laughs) And yeah. Just like everybody else has said, the crowd is standing around going, help, someone help Sebastian. (laughs) Sebastian's being eaten by zombies. Help, someone needs to go help. And everybody's just standing there watching. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. 
And I'm like, <laughs> you know, payback, payback is a bitch. And payback is, is karma's sister. So, you know, <laughs> he, he earned every inch of that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, if that was all of our awesome sauces, let's get into our week. Yo, worthless and weak. And we got one from Glennis from Toronto, and she said, "Come on, Judith, tell Daryl that Rick Grimes is still alive." Actually, she said, "Oh, well, I guess yeah. I guess Judith did know from her mom." And Daryl should have realized Michonne would never have just deserted everyone, especially Judith and her son, RJ, to help some strangers out. Yeah, I was thinking that the other way around for some reason when I read that. But yeah, no, like, Judith knows, or at least knows that Michonne went to go, yeah, looking for him. So, well, that's Rick Grimes. I thought he knew that. I thought he knew that already. I don't think no? he does. I think, because Michonne, I don't think Michonne and Daryl ever had any kind of like interaction or talk. I don't know. I have to go back and like kind of go, ch- you know, check out because I don't know if they had any react interaction before she took off to go. I, I don't think that they need to, I, you know, I'm just saying that they, that he, he would have known just from Judith already telling him unless did Michonne say, don't tell Daryl. I don't think that that happened. Yeah. No. Oh, well, nope. Because of all the people that are going to be big bean spillers, I don't see this going to be Daryl. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. All right. Well, thank you, Glennis. Uh, so that was all the listeners' week sauce. Uh, so let's go into ours. Um, Brian, you want to take it? Well, I mean, last episode, I brought up the the good old time and distance thing. And I had that again. Um just for example, like how far was it to the Commonwealth based on, you know, where they were that basically had, you know, they had Maggie, Aaron, you know, and, um, who else is there? Negan, um, Carol, Daryl, uh, you know, and then all the Commonwealth people, you know, Mercer and Pamela and, and uh, Hornsby and who else was there that I'm forgetting? Oh yeah, um, and 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 uh, Maggie. Uh, anyway, they're all there. So, like, how far out are they? Like, are are they anywhere close to uh, Alexandria? And if they are, like, here we are again. Like, isn't the Commonwealth we think supposed to be in Ohio or Pennsylvania or something like that? Um, it's not like a trivial distance away. So, yeah, you know, and yes, we've, you know, they, they make it up as they go when it comes to, you know, how far is it? Well, how far are you, does it need to be, you know, but yeah, it's still, it's, we're still back to the same old thing. It's as close as it needs to be. And it's as far away as it needs to be. be. <laughs> yeah. And it's still the same thing you're getting at, Brian, is that. If they were that close, why haven't they run into them before right. with all yeah. the traveling and scavenging and stuff that they did? Why didn't they run into the Commonwealth before? And B, conversely, why didn't the Commonwealth run into our people before if they were that close? But if they're that far away that there was sort of a natural barrier and a reason for them not to then why is it so easy for everybody to get back to where we were originally? Yep. It's like time and distance are malleable as to whatever the plot dictates. Right. That the, the map, the map is like a great wormhole that can bend in on itself. And suddenly Pittsburgh is next to Alexandria. (laughs) And then when it doesn't need to be, it flattens out like a great sheet so that it puts the huge, you know, plains of Pennsylvania in between the Commonwealth and Virginia. (laughs) Yeah. Convenient. Yeah. No. Um, getting to my next thing. Um, I thought it was awfully convenient that um, Hornsby's toadies, and that's what I'm going to call them, They're to- it's toadies, uh, 
you know, kill those workers. And they somehow all eight of them reanimate all at the same time. We know that people reanimate at different times. So for them to reanimate all, you know, at the same time, again, obviously, uh, convenience of plot here. So I thought that was a bit weak. Next, given all the guards that were there, um, you know, whatever you, you call the stormtroopers, um, as ineffective as their uh, uniform seems to be, um, given, you know, all their uh, armaments and whatnot, how could eight walkers cause so much chaos there? Yes, I know most of those citizens aren't, you know, really capable with, with walkers, but um, considering the chaos of just a few of them, you know, and then, you know, the, the people that they, they kill, um, (laughs) it it was, it was a lot for, for only eight, you know, that that's, that's my point. If it had been 50 or if it had been 25, even I could have bought it, but eight in a crowd of probably hundreds, if not thousands of people seemed a bit extreme to me. So yeah, that was my, my take. And lastly, how did Eugene get the solo job? And I have to say solo job to, <laughs> uh, you know, play the, uh, be the mixer at, at the, you know, at the event, get, be up there, you know, with the mixer and, and, you know, with the loudspeakers and make sure that, that everyone could hear and conveniently hook up the tape recorder and play the sound. Um, I would have thought that like him playing it. Yes. Okay. But him being alone there, I thought was a bit of a stretch. Well, he is the president of the AV club. (laughs) That's what I was about to say. He's like, he's (laughs) the main AV guy. He knows lots about electronics. He's smart. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Those, that's, those are really good points. Um, because it, it is one of those things where and it, it kind of came across my mind too whenever the walkers showed up that yeah I didn't really think about like oh there's only eight of them because it just seemed like there was a lot of those workers that, that got shot but yeah it was kind of eight and it is also like okay there was like <clears throat> the whole scene got really really kind of like weird and disjointed because you know we're looking at this the view of the camera so then it's like everybody's just running around so it makes it look more chaotic but then i started thinking about like well again there's that whole thing where it's like yeah a human being like you have like your sight is like you're able to see a a lot more you know and be able to judge distances and all this other stuff and there was just seemed like everybody was running around and they were either like oh we're stuck in a four by four room you know and (laughs) bumping into each other and the walkers are just like they can easily grab you and just start biting into you and it seems like you're in this huge square there's you're in a like this is a large area that you have plenty of places to run away (laughs) and like not let a walker touch you um given the fact also that like there's how many guards did they all just take their lunch break and that's how this happens because like you yeah think that, exactly you think there would have already been like a perimeter around these people of guards that well maybe maybe they were getting caramel apples or i i mean meeting, the, meeting their teammate behind the <laughs> the supply shed yeah. Well, it is the Commonwealth soldiers and they do seem to be very not the best and maybe Well, it's yeah. it's back to they're they're only there when they need to be. Right. That it's like for some reason, you know, they're off taking a powder somewhere or who knows? Maybe they've got everybody pulled out fighting, you know, fighting that horde. Maybe. Or on the fence and they're thinking, ah, we're in the middle of town. What could happen? Yeah. And that was also, it's like, it kind of bugged me though, too. It's like, uh, when Eugene and Max were like going through the crowd and then they get separated and it was just like, it doesn't look like it's really that many people. (laughs) And like, just because someone bumps into you, like 
that shouldn't be enough to like, oh, I just like now I'm just I got knocked away a distance from you that I can't find you anymore or whatever. I don't know. I just <laughs> I'm I'm nitpicking, but it was just a little like, come on, like that you guys are like right next to each other basically. It's like there's no way that that would have been enough to like disorient you and then as much as Eugene you love Max like you would have never have taken your eyes off of her and let anything like that happen but it worked out because then that led to Sebastian dying so I'm fine with that then (laughs) all right well if there's no other weak sauces let's move on to our what sauce what 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 and we'll start with Dieta from Detroit and she says Sebastian getting mauled by the walker while everyone calmly watches. Meanwhile, folks are still screaming. (laughs) Scream emoji. And running in the background for the other walkers. So they are that happy Sebastian's getting his just desserts that they forgot about the rest of the walkers nearby? Question mark. I call bullshit. (laughs) Would watch safely from my locked home from the windows away from the dead terrorizing the streets. (laughs) Crying face emoji. Or laughing on the rolling on the floor laughing. Um, And then she says, overall, another solid episode. Thumbs up. A-OK heart emoji. Yeah, it's it's just that's just how that's that's just how it always is. It's like I still don't understand. Like I'm well, and it was fear though. It's just like how walkers are like so silent until they need to not be silent, and that's when they're right. like right next to you, biting into your arm. Mm-hmm. When it's like <laughs> you're standing in the middle of an open field. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Looks like next up is Mike from Asheville. He goes, "Oh, is the wrestling a metaphor? Everyone knows that wrestling is air quote fake and is just a show." Pamela and the Commonwealth are just a show. And I would say, no, Mike, wrestling's not fake. It's scripted. <laughs> you still you still have to throw people around and you still have to fall convincingly and do all the things. It's just you know who's going to win and who's not. <laughs> and next he goes on to say, Oceanside, we still don't know what happened there with Lance. This episode finally mentions them for all we know. Aaron will be walking into a zombie camp. <laughs> I think we know. That's all I have to say. I, I, it's far. It's it's the um, best untold secret in The Walking Dead. Yeah, it's going to be uh, an ocean side of walkers. Yep. I hate to say it, but that's uh, you know they've kind of telegraphed it. I, it may end up being something different, but but. Um, or I you wonder know. if the, there may be one survivor, but I mean, yeah, I, I agree. It kind of like that's what their whole the whole ending of you know the last or what, episode sixteen was just like. Or it'll be like one survivor, and it'll be um, uh, what's his face the the annoying guy, um, the guy that took Michonne. Oh yeah, a uh, druggy guy or. Yeah, mushroom tripping, guy. Trip, tripping mushrooms guy. <laughs> <laughs> I already forgot his name. Nice. Renee from Fairburn. What the hell sauce? Wrestling? Really? Wrestling? Face bomb, face bomb. Yoga <laughs> was on the other show, and now wrestling. The way they were running, y'all should have been in training. You see, our peeps ran toward the fight. Not from it because they have been training, not watching some fake behind wrestling. <laughs> and then that would be big eye, big eye, um, up eyebrow face, big eye, up eyebrow face. I don't know what else to call it. Let's say shocked face. Yeah, I think it's shocked face or in disbelief or I need, I need a course. <laughs> <laughs> Funny thing is, Renee's about my age too, you know. We're we're about the same age, but uh, Renee, you seem to understand it much better than I do. <laughs> so, so kudos to you. Anyway, so I seem to be the only one with what sauce written down. So should I go next? Yep, you got it. Here's a here's an odd what, but I'll I'll start with this. Um, they're actually both. Uh, Pamela related. Why did Pamela Milton's father take 
the uh, title of President Milton, but she's got the title of Governor Milton. I know, I know, I know. LT, why don't you share that with the the well, class? I'll, I'll share with the class. If you recall, when they were talking about uh, her father, he was a senator. Right. And he was still in Washington after the collapse and after things happened. And it was my impression that he was basically like Speaker of the House. So he oh. may have been next in line in secession after the president was eaten and after the vice president was eaten. It was Yeah, that was my impression that there was some vestigial parts of the government. And it was one of the very first Commonwealth episodes when they're talking about how they got there. And it was my impression that for a very short time, he was actually president. Mm. And then they collapsed in on themselves, and he took his people and fled and founded the Commonwealth. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I could be absolutely wrong, and I'm sure somebody out there will come beat me with a cannon stick, but uh, that was what I recall from those episodes. And if you go to TWDshop.com, you can get the uh, illustrated history of the Commonwealth. Um, and if you're in uh, next week's um, Talking Dead, you'll get a copy. <laughs> and you'll get a copy. And you'll get a copy. <laughs> I am in one of those moods this week. So, um, hey, Brian and Kyle, if you look under your seat, you'll have a copy <laughs> of that book for today. <laughs> and I'll say, uh, secondly, uh, despite Milton being a governor and not a present president, um, she appears to be too busy protecting the family legacy and doing that uh, instead of be, trying to be a good leader. Um, because if she was a good leader, she would realize that Sebastian would not be a good leader and start to work on hell. I think Hornsby would be a better leader of the Commonwealth than Sebastian would. <laughs> That's saying something, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. But um, she would be not like, uh, there's no reason why Sebastian should be um, inheriting that position. No, that position should be elected. Right. But that's should Yeah. And that just shows the insight of basically Pamela Milton and what they think of themselves. They think of themselves as like, you know, royalty, like, you know, like upper, like, you know, like caste system. So it's kind of like that her mind's all twisted in that, that it's like, Oh no, no, no one else can do this, but her, Right. You know, and it's it's that she, whole thing of, you know, we were educated at Ivy League schools and we, mm -hmm. you know, we're the smart people. You know, we spend our summer in the Hamptons with all the other smart people. So, you know, it's only natural that some people are born to be leaders and some people are born to be, you know, serfs. Right. And uh, that, is, that is true. And um, the difference is... She is at least artful about it, and Sebastian is not. Right. You know, Sebastian is just an arrogant shit, and it's the same. You know, it's the same mentality, except that Pamela is more polished, and she knows how to play the game. Yeah, she's not a good mother, though. Otherwise, well, no, she she's not a good mother. No, I know. I say it's like it's just kind of like you know she probably looks at some of it being all like, oh, I screwed up with this, but I'm trying to force this round hole, you know, round what a square peg in a round hole, just for her pride or whatever, her legacy. Yep. And that's basically all that I had. We already talked about the wrestling stuff, so okay. yeah. All right. Well, uh, yeah. All right. Unless anybody has anything else to say, let's go into well, the. Uh, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say the the only thing that still I'm still whatting over just a little bit is I think Hornsby is not being very situationally aware in that he's gone ahead and executed his plan. You know, I think his plan started moving the minute he got caught and that things didn't work out like he expected. 
the problem is, I think that he doesn't quite understand how the game has changed. That I think what's happened, where I'm confused, is he's going to go ahead with his thing, but does he not understand that something is already in motion, or was the fact of the chaos in town, was that sort of his idea to kind of come save the day and say, see, I should be in charge because I fixed everything and Pamela let everything go to hell. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's just, he's very, just, he's just arrogant. Thinking. And, and, yeah, and it's the bottom line that, you know, was, was Pamela just that blind to everything? Was she that out of the loop that she just didn't see the stuff on the ground? Seems that I mean, way. Yeah. It seems that way, yeah. But it just, yeah. it just definitely sets me back a little bit because if you're going to be a good maniacal leader, you kind of have to have, good information on what's going on in the general populace because i'm sure that the governor kind of had a handle on what everybody else was thinking you know i don't i think he was the sort that he would have had people that would have been feeding him information and nobody was really telling pamela anything and maybe that's hornsby Uh, you know maybe hornsby was keeping her in the dark but hmm. after this last go-round i think that she was the sort that just assumed well we have people to take care of that and she's too busy you know hunting pheasants and doing whatever planting cotillions and whatever (laughs) else she was doing (laughs) you know signing papers and reading proclamations (laughs) yeah yeah agree all right well i guess then that takes us into our what the hell or oh hell no sauce And we just got one um, from Deanna from Detroit, and she said, I guess about wrestling again, WWE and the Apocalypse, this is how they celebrate Founders Day with a stage wrestling match. This is as bad as their aerobics on the riverboat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yep. All right. Well, that um, was the only what the hell sauce, so let's go into our sad and awe sauce. Aww. All right. Renee from Fairburn. Uh, all sad and all sauce is seeing Rick's gun. She's like crying out loud emoji. Uh, man, I was all in my feelings. I cannot wait until the Rashon show airs. This is what I was trying to remember on my voicemail. Shrug, shrug, which we'll get to later. Yep. And Emma from the UK says, Judith showing true grime spirit and wanting to help others. Aww. <laughs> and she has like the little lovey heart eye face. Yep. Yeah, Judith was definitely a awe, as always, because <laughs> she is, she, I was, well, I mean, I guess, um, I guess it just, it kind of, seeing uh, Daryl and Judith have that little interaction was cute for one, because it's just like their family, you know, and it's just seeing them together and like, you know, like Daryl being like basically her dad in a sense. And, um, you know, it was just like, it was Giving me, a, you know, there, there's a lot of changes in the show from obviously with the comics, mm-hmm. but it was like seeing Judith and then like their little interactions and it was making me being like, ah, oh, you know, she's, this is Carl, you know, like, and that was kind of taken from us, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. for, you know, their reasons. Cause you know, Rick is also gone right now until hopefully we get to see more of him um, in this, you know, in this back half. But um, still, it's yeah, it's like it kind of left me a little bit missing good old Carl, and because Judith and I feel like Negan kind of have that same kind of you know relationship, especially at this far you know part that this would be like you know you know whether or not we see it, but like I can see where it's like maybe a Negan comes in and Judith like do something to like you know team up or whatever because they both kind of still have this like somewhat of a respect for each other <clears throat> all right well that was all of our uh uh listeners sad and awesome so do you guys have any sad and awesome i have two um just first of all um judith she still has innocence 
you know, uh, so it was kind of sad to see her, you know, go through all of that. And, you know, the, like she's trying to, you know, insist that this is a better place and all that. And <laughs> then of course that's all wiped away at the end of the episode when she's seeing the walkers come in there and, you know, she finally does what she needs to do and take daddy's gun and, you know, so, so it was just kind of sad to see the final bit of innocence, I think, kind of go away from her. Uh, the last thing, um, Negan, and I had to look up to see what her name was, uh, but her name is Annie, uh, Negan's wife, having the ultrasound. And I thought of singing LT, having my baby. <laughs> 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 no, it's the, 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 the I love you <laughs> having my baby. Uh, yep. <laughs> well, it's definitely one of those things that on that scene, thinking about they were living in that, you know, that crap house apartment building with uh, Michael Bean. And then there they are in an ice clean hospital room with an ultrasound machine. Yep. And just to dovetail off of something you said about Judith, it was not, and I, I, I've all, I, I can't think of her name, but seeing the look on her face, you know, besides the fact that she was like, I don't want a gun, I don't want a gun, and Daryl's kind of going, well, it's your dad's gun. You know, just that fact that she was packing that thing for a long time, and then she was like, like you said, it's like she's trying to be in a better place and kind of get over all the stuff that she had to deal with in Alexandria. And then the fact of she went back to the gun and she shot that walker and she had that look on her face. And what sold it for me was not just her, not just not just the young actor's face, but when her buddy was in the crowd and was just looking at her and going, you know, that oh, open yeah. mouth shocked and she's going, the little girl that I've been playing Barbies with in color and just shot this guy. It's a stone cold killer. Yeah. Stone cold. One round to the coconut with a big silver revolver. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, then that leads us into our feedback. We can talk about it. We're done talking. Time to listen. All right. We did get some written feedback from Renee a little bit, but um, she did also send in an email or a voicemail. So let's listen to Renee. Hi, guys. This is Renee from Fairburn. <clears throat> it's the fall, so my allergies, they kind of acting up again. OMG, when I tell you this episode was so freaking good. I mean, Sebastian, you really got what you deserve. You really did. Now, I didn't understand why the people were just standing around, just looking at him, um, getting ate up by the zombie, because I would have got the hell on. Like, the zombies were still there. Like, so I don't know why y'all was standing around, but that part was just, um, unbelievable to me. That was, that, like, seriously, really run, run. But, and then a part with Daryl and, um, and um, what's the little, I'm having a brain freeze because my allergies are acting crazy. Judith, it was so good. It was so well acted. It was just so, it was just organic. It just, it really was. I mean, you know what I'm saying? He, when he was telling her, you know, I used to go places too. You know, I had to hide in a place that I would go when I wanted to be alone because of my father and stuff. It was so good. That just, it really touched me, you know, and um. He's such a, and like he said, he didn't know what he was doing because Daryl is a loner. He's not used to taking care of kids. He's used to, you know, just himself. And now he has Judith and RJ and, you know, this is new to him. And he did an awesome job and Rick and Michonne will really be proud. That's why, in which I don't condone this. I'm not, under, I, I would never understood, understand why Michonne chose to do this. And I can't w not wait to, um, the series come out so she can explain that. But that's why she, um, felt comfortable enough to leave 
them with Daryl. They she knew that Daryl had them. She knew that Uncle Daryl had them. And um so that that part was really well acted. And Eugene and um his girlfriend, oh my goodness, just to think to get Sebastian all worked up like that. And I didn't even see I, I actually I saw the tape recorder, but I didn't know what she was doing. I didn't peep it. I did not peep what she was doing. But when they when um he got ready to come on and I saw Eugene, that's when I said, Oh, they about to they they about to play that recording. They're getting ready to play it. That's why she had him acting like that. That's why she did what she did. They're getting ready to play the recording. And I told you guys um, that I felt like Pamela knew what was going on. I feel like Pamela knows. I feel like she knows. I don't feel like that she knows some things and she just, she just know, she know what's going on. She just chooses to overlook it. She's like, what's going on in society right now? Trust me. They know what's going on. They choose to overlook it. They know exactly what's going on. So, um, Pamela, she, she's going to get hers as well. And, um, uh, you know, the episode, like I said, was really good. And my thing is with our people, and I know that you have to help people and, you know, you have to do stuff like that, but that irks me. That really irks me. I think Dieta said that on the Facebook page. That irks me. Get, just leave. Go on. You get y'all should get tired of helping people. Go on. Pack y'all stuff up and go on about your business. Leave them people alone. Go back to Alexandra to the hilltop, Oceanside. Go back. Y'all always separating and doing stuff. Go back to our people. Y'all always trying to save someone. Just you know, save us for once. But then that's hard because I'm like that too as well. While I'm running my mouth, I would probably be one of the people that try. I would be like King Ezekiel. We can, we, you know, we, we can all help. I would be like that. So I don't know why I said that because I'm always trying to help someone. <laughs> but, um, yeah, the episode, it was really good. Um, let me think what else did I, cause it was something else that I saw. That I want to mention. I can't think of it. But I'm getting ready to go on the Facebook page. And do my feedback. So I'll. Um, once If I remember it. Then I'll mention it on that. Alrighty. Talk to you guys later. Bye. <laughs> always. 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 Awesome Renee. Thank you. Um, yeah. And you already mentioned that you remembered what you said. Um, yeah. Some good points there. All I have to say, Renee, is when you mention allergies, I have to say me too. My nose has been running like a um, <laughs> leaky faucet all day, and uh, I think it's only stopped a little bit uh, while we've been recording, but it's still I've still been dealing with it all the way through this episode. <laughs> I've been uh, extremely lucky so far this year. After my one week of fall, I think the hurricane kind of blew the pollen away, <laughs> you know, up, up into Virginia. So I, I haven't, I haven't been that bad. Normally this is about the time of year that I end up with Jack Palance's voice for about two or three days. <laughs> and the you other know, thing I was so, going so to so say, I get, the, I get the opportunity of doing believe it or not. <laughs> Believe it or not. The other thing I was going to say is that um, why did Michonne leave Judith to go search for Rick? <laughs> um, real life. That's yep. that's why. You know, it's one of those one of those goofy things. The, the the things that we see are they don't they don't make sense because um, real life got in the way and twisted around the plot. Like why did why did uh, Dr. Crusher leave Wesley at, on the Enterprise in season two? Because <laughs> Maurice Hurley, the showrunner for TNG at the time, hated Beverly uh, or hated Gates McFadden. So so he got rid of the character and brought uh, Diana Moldar, you know, yep. and <laughs> Dr. Pulaski. Exactly. <laughs> who was who was basically. Um, not much more than a, a, a female Dr. McCoy. Exactly. That's why that, that's, that's a bad why thing. that's why I'm waiting for the new next gen spinoff, you know, Star Trek Jellico. And I want I want <sighs> Dr. Pulaski to be his CMO. <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny. 
All right. Well, thank you, Renee, for your voicemail, as always. Uh, she did put a little bit of uh, her written feedback and kind of along the same line as what she said. It was just a uh, solid episode, um, but she's waiting for Pamela to get hers because she knew her son was not fit to run nothing, and yet she was pushing him, talking about his need to get ready to take over. And what's up with these politicians allowing liars and people with no integrity to be voted into office when they need to go sit down somewhere? <laughs> well, that's that's how you say, you know, treating it like it's like a like it's a given. monarchy, you know, it's like that that man would have had to have been elected and um, he was non electable. Yeah, not electable, which then also yeah. kind of comes into that. Obviously, they don't seem to have elections unless they're rigged because they haven't really talked about that or. No, they know, haven't talked about it. You know, showing that whole part of how that happens all right next oh deanna from detroit says carol made a deal with the devil for our people to leave of their own free will for hornsby to take the fall love how carol always has a backup plan she is a pro at this when it comes to community infiltration hornsby is still calling shots pamela doesn't realize she she would have been better off letting daryl finish him off because now he is wreaking havoc from the cell Hornsby saying if something happens to him, the alliances will come a-looking. And you got googly eye, googly eye, chin scratch, chin scratch. So does this mean the CRM? It took away my idea. So, <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm thinking it is. So maybe at the end of this season, we're going to see a little hint of the CRM. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I need you to do me a favor. I'm going to uh -huh. read the last line again, and I need you to shock horror at the end. Okay. So does this mean CRM? Thank you. I wasn't <laughs> ready for it. So <laughs> You need to put cues in there. <laughs> okay. Why does our group choose to split up all the time? Yes. Why do they? I mean, let's everybody pack up, pack up our stuff and get the heck out of dodge together let the commonwealth destroy themselves i get trying to help but you can't help if they don't want to be helped this is the governor all over again only female instead and she has rolled on the floor rolled on the floor <laughs> that's not far from the truth yeah mm -hmm. so if she doesn't Except have a, I, I don't she doesn't have a cabinet full of heads yeah <laughs> and a, a, an aquarium and she finishes up by saying, I loved how Eugene and Max got Sebastian to tell everybody how he really feels about the Commonwealth. Hornsby unleashing his henchmen, killing Commonwealthers and letting them turn to walkers inside the gates. No one is the wiser. Nobody thought to check on the workers setting up for Founders Day. And were all the guards? And where were all the guards? Nobody patrols the community just in case somebody dies in their sleep or drops dead. Not too believable. A whole crew dies and nobody notices. Mm -hmm. Well, I won't say nobody notices. They noticed. Exactly. <laughs> too late. Yeah. No, but that's, a, that, I mean, it's an interesting point because, you know, when World Beyond started, like, we got introduced to that really quickly um, with, uh, what, is it Iris um, at the beginning and that, that her, her, uh, what do you call it? Uh, psychologist or whoever the woman that she was meeting with. And yes. Then, oxygen and lady. Then, yeah. And then later on. Yeah. Then we see that like, oh, yeah. Like they're all behind kind of like, you know, locked doors in a sense. That's why they had the hurricane doors mm -hmm. on the apartments. So oh, it's like we got a okay. little taste of that in that sense. But that, of okay. course, was CRM or, you know, or. You know, world beyond so it's a little different i guess but here it's like commonwealth it's like you think that everybody's infected we all know that so it's like what are they doing to basically protect that because i'm um, you know do the elderly get put into homes and just got you know watched 24 7 or you know it's like someone's gonna die in their sleep and or you know people murder there's got to be you know something going on to where it's like this is not the first time someone died unexpectedly and turned into a walker in their sleep and ate half their family <laughs> and it won't be the last all right next ivan from minnesota he says overall another really solid episode with lance and sebastian being the star being the stars 
The walkers in the crowd brought back the horror and I enjoyed the chaos. Also, as happy as I am at Sebastian's demise, I want to give a shout out to the actor who <laughs> killed it as our favorite annoying asshole. I'm sure you're an awesome guy in real life. Uh, and <laughs> fist bump. I can't and fist think bump. of the kid's name. But uh, it's Teo Rap. Yes, yeah, like he's he's hyphenated. Yeah, Teo Rap Olson. He was hysterical on Talking Dead. Yeah. And it was so funny. It's like, well, we hate to see you go. <laughs> you know, we want to keep you on cast. We just don't like Sebastian. And it really, you know, from some of the interviews I've seen of some of our favorite jerk characters, they, they're they you know, pretty personable actors. You know, none of the people that are jerks on screen have, in walking dead world that I've known of have been jerks off camera, but yeah, mega props to him because he, he brought it so much that one thing we need to do at some point is we need to have like a hero, a heroes and assholes episode and just go back through and say, you know, these were some of my favorite good guys. And these were some of my favorite jerks. Because mm -hmm. we have we have quite a few now. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I used to think that uh, Deanna's son was pretty well up there. But, mm -hmm. and on that note, isn't it interesting that everybody that ends up being powerful has jerk-ass kids? <laughs> it goes with the territory, I think. Yep. It's, it's all about entitlement. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and that, I think, you know, if you wanted to... If you wanted one word for Sebastian, entitled mm -hmm. is a good word to use yes. for him. Yep. No, exactly. All right. Well, thank you, Ivan. Um, next is Emma from the UK, and she says, overall, I wasn't sure about this episode as it started, but boy, did it heat up. And now looking forward to the after aftermath, Commonwealth in Meltdown. <laughs> okay. Mike from Ashland says, this is like peak Walking Dead. Great episode. It's set up so much. There are many players in this game, and they are all making moves. I hate to be that guy, but can <laughs> we talk about our group? I love them. I really do. But this episode made me think, are our group really kind of bad? I mean, everywhere they go, they make trouble. The Commonwealth was not perfect, but it could have been fixed over time. I know, I know, it's a show. We need action, but I can't can't help but think back through the show and every new place our group goes in and makes a mess, which eventually <laughs> destroys great locations. <laughs> now, Dieta replied to him and said, Mike, I was thinking the same thing. Every community they come across, they either destroy or take over. It does make one start to wonder. And she goes on to say, but hard to be decided he, he wanted to Commodore all of the communities, even though they declined and wanted to remain separate. Then he decided he was going to attack Negan's new community because he thought they had stolen from him. So he technically brought the downfall on himself. Our people were just pawns in his chess game. Checkmate. And <laughs> Mike replies to that. It's a very good point. Hornsby definitely initiated the downfall. He got greedy. Mm -hmm. Now. I have to step in here for a moment and say, I don't think it's our guy's fault. I think that the common trope that I have mentioned on several occasions, and if you've listened to us here and on fear, you've heard me say it, that walking dead always has the, this is why we can't have nice things trope. Every time we go somewhere and it's like at the prison, you know, Rick was starting to relax he was growing corn. He was having long talks with Carl about stuff and things. And then what happened? Governor shows up, kill Herschel, things go to hell. Mm -hmm. When they were at Herschel's farm, everything was great until Shane. Things went bad. They had to leave. I mean, it's kind of, you know, even in fear. They were set up in Humbug Gulch. Everything's wonderful. Then it's not. It's yeah. still the way they always do it is, hey, we're in this great place. It's got everything we need. And then something happens. It's like, oh, crap, we've got to go. 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, even even Alexandria, things were going okay. Then we had what was it, porch dick. Yeah. Yeah. And then Negan shows up. And things got bad. We got rid of Negan and everything was okay. And then Alpha shows up. I, I, I'm i just saying, I'm not blaming our guys. I'm just kind of blaming the big invisible hand in the sky that makes things happen to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I would say so that they just are always, they just have really bad luck. Because <laughs> it's not necessarily like they like cause the Commonwealth to fall apart or do what it's doing because that was already happening by you know you know the leaders or who was in charge you know they just happened to be there at the time that's like oh okay this is when it's starting to bubble up and yeah they might have some hand in maybe pushing a little a little bit here at least in the commonwealth but at the same time you know it's like it's just our 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 people are more experienced than (laughs) everybody that they've met (laughs) and that's why they always mostly keep surviving that they are. All right. Next. Glennis from Toronto. She says, Daryl stabbing Lance in the hand. Is that to suffer for his crimes and symbolic for Lance's later crucifixion with a stab to the head instead of a, instead of to his side to make sure he is dead? The Commonwealth were trying to show how normal everything was with celebrating their founder's day with a wrestling match. Lance's two cronies can be strung up on either side of him for killing those innocent cleaners when his plot is uncovered to overthrow Pam Milton. I wonder if Eugene and Max are going to be blamed for the invasion of Walkers too, with them outing Sebastian since he then also died by Walker bite. And for that matter, is the deal Carol made with Pam Milton now rescinded for the whole group and they are now Wanted for treason and murder. That's a good question. I don't know. Uh, Judith was clinging on to the false normalcy that the Commonwealth seemed to be offering, but now accepting the gun from Daryl and shooting walkers that hope for normalcy has vanished. The episode was nearly back to the good old TWD days. Only thing that will make it perfect is, yeah, I know I'm a stuck record. Rick Grimes. <laughs> Rick Grimes. Rick Grimes. Coral. Coral. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, I hope we get Rick Grimes sooner than later, but I'm not sure what their plans are. Uh, besides the spinoff. I believe that's supposed to be, it's supposed to be a six part um, s- yeah. limited series. Yeah. And that's it. Like, it always seems like the, the shows, the first season are six episodes, but except for, the kids show which was 10 yeah but that that was a limited limited series right so. they already yeah that, that's true um well no i'm just curious are we going to besides obviously some of the little like flashbacks and stuff at the beginning of each episode so far but um are we going to get any yeah like are we going to get any answers with like the a connection to crm in the end of this you know it's like are we going to get a rick Grimes sighting you know in some way that's not just a flashback from when he was first taken you know it's kind of like it's you know it'll be interesting to see what they do because you know they went from we were going to make three movies to now we're doing a six you know episode run yeah mind you i like that better so i'm not complaining Oh yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I I agree. I just I was just kind of making a point of like, yeah, everything changed in what their original grand scheme was to like, you know, now that they're going this way, which seems to be a not of why we have so many spinoffs now <laughs> that they might are just going to start kind of doing. Maybe that's their their mo. See how long they can stretch this out. Ugh. Wow. That was, you know, when they when they said back back in, I think ninety seven or something like that that uh, or ninety seven uh, twenty seventeen that you know they intended to um, you know have the show go on for twenty seasons um, that was not looked upon well but mm-hmm. but yeah. 
I, you know, I, I mean, it, it's essentially what we've seen all of TV do. And we were talking about this before, and we'll talk about this in the ratings in a minute. Um, just how, you know, diluted things di- here we go again. Cause we, cause I, uh, <laughs> there's, there's a dilution of, of things not to be deluded, but, uh, a, a a dilution of of uh, of ratings, so they're less concentrated, more spread out. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yes, it's dilution, dilution, as opposed to diluted. Anyway, oh, or, you guys knew or what I meant. Delusion, yes. like little tiny Jesuses. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, delusion. <laughs> Uh, okay. All right. So, anybody else have anything else to say before we move on? I mean, I was going to bring up the whole um, Hornsby talking about certain stabilizing forces, um, which Dieta and I both agree. I think was he was um, eluding to CRM, and you know, I, I've often thought that it was odd that um you could have the um a a big settlement like the commonwealth and we don't hear of the crm at all Mm -hmm. it is a little odd especially when you consider that the crm is to the east and west of the commonwealth so they're they're basically not really surrounding them but they're they're at least surrounding them on two fronts so they're flanking them, I guess right, you could right. say. Um, but yeah, I I believe it has something to do with the CRM, but we'll find out soon yep. en- enough, I think. All right. And um, I, I want to just throw out certain stabilizing forces. We already know that Hornsby had his little secret, uh, whatever you want to call them, you know, his weather underground his, uh, you know, CIA black ops team, yeah, the people that mm-hmm. were not just the troopies that he was taking out, but like the, you remember the one guy when they were doing the deal with Leah when they were going after uh, Hilltop that they had the regular uniformed guys, but they had the one guy that was wearing black fatigues. He was not Leah's guy. He was Hornsby's guy. But he was the one guy that was not in the regular uh, Commonwealth troopy suit. Mm -hmm. See, and and we do see that, um, like uh, Milton had some of those people as well. They had like a black uniform on with like a like a a rope thing on on their shoulder. But this was more. This was also more, you know, like a field uniform. You know, not necessarily the dress uniform guys, but I I saw what you were saying. But I'm thinking that part of his stabilizing forces may be that he sort of had a, you know, a Stasi. You know, he had his secret police running around, uh, keeping the dissenters down. I mean, we know that he was making people disappear. Right, right. So maybe, you know, his stabilizing forces are... We'll we'll just get some of those people that we've had in our secret basement prison, and we'll tell them, "Look, we're here to turn you loose because Pamela has gone off the rails." So you'll have a group of angry, disaffected people that are blaming the current administration, and Hornsby can come in if they didn't necessarily know it was him, and say, "Look, you know, we saved you." Right. Right, and we also know that he's got people out with the drug dealers and whoever else. So there's no telling who who you know how many cookie jars he has a finger in. Finger in. <laughs> True. All right. Um. Yeah. No. It, it's just more questions. More questions for sure. Because the 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 only caveat that I have is that knowing how CRM has done. In the past, I don't think that they're much on the secret alliance f- 
front. It seems like most of their stuff has been kind of up front. And I guess I would expect that if it was CRM, we would have already seen CH-47s with Connex boxes full of walkers on their doorstep. Mm, yeah. It just seems to me that if CRM does does something, they tend to use the biggest hammer possible. <laughs> now, yeah, uh, unless it's not them, that's uh, you know it, they're they're being hidden from us by reason of plot. Well, right, and I, I won't disagree if that is the case because it would be a very convenient and also probable segue. But just by the way we've seen them operate on the kids show, right, it just right. seems to me that uh, they are not the scalpel people. They are the sledgehammer people. So we'll see. Yeah. We should yeah. see. Very well, true. We should see. Hopefully we'll see, because if they do not do anything, then it's kind of like, what's the point of why would you bring them up? <laughs> All right, well, if that was all we have, let's go into our news, ratings, and info. There's a couple weird stories on the news. So it's time for ratings. So for Season 11, Episode 18, we got a 0.29 in the 18 to 49 with 1.347 million viewers. That's up from last week, where Episode 17 got a 0.27 0.27 in the 18 to 49 with 1.185 million viewers. So rough math, close to one and three quarters, close to two. So that's that's a plus. They got a 0.47 in the 25 to 54 and a 0.79 in the 50 plus. And that is also up from last week, which had a 0.42 and a 0.70 respectively. So it's good to see that this episode was up and with good reason. So if we go down to the Talking Dead, the Talking Dead episode for episode 18, ooh, got a 0.04 in the 1849 with 339,000 viewers. As compared to last week, which got a 0.06 in the 18 to 49 with 326,000 viewers. Um, Once again, I don't know how they calculate that, where we had more viewers, but a lower rating. Yeah. Well, that's that's basically because um, like if you if they took the cross section of 18 to 49 viewers, it would be less. So it's just that there are demographics that, you know, it's that like say the 50 and over uh, may have watched more of the, uh, of the episode than, um, than the, uh, than the 1849s. Well, it's the same thing we've said for many episodes that with the longevity of the show and the graying of the fan base that tends to push us into the older demographic. Mm-hmm. Isn't that right, Brian? Yes. Since both of us, since both of us are now in the much less coveted fifty plus. Yes. Now, just for a comparison, um, the only ones that covet us are um, selling Cadillac, uh, Lincoln, and Insure. So, <laughs> and Medicare supplement. <laughs> <laughs> and Medicare supplements, yeah, and hearing aids, hearing what? aids. Uh, they they were they had hearing aid commercials on The Walking Dead this what? this week. <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> I caught that. And just for a little comp- contrast and comparison, um, our fabulous statistician pulled up the ratings for interview with a vampire An interview with a vampire got a 0.09 in the 18 to 49 with 525,000 viewers, a 0.14 in the 25 to 54 and a 0.32 in the 50 plus. And compare that with, we also have stats for house of the dragon house. of The dragon got a zero. 
0.40 in the 18 to 49 with 1.731 million viewers. Yep. So there we go. It's good to see the main show getting a tick up this week. I think that with, and I know that AMC is not listening to me, but AMC, please listen to me. <laughs> I think that uh, Talking Dead would do better if it was run in the place we're used to seeing it rather than 11 o'clock after interviewing oh, yeah. the vampire. No, I, I agree. I, I totally agree, too. Just it's not how they want to play it. Nope. They haven't done that. I mean, it's, they've done this for a very long time now, mm-hmm. or they just they don't do the companion show after that. It's almost kind of like they could have used that to try to get more subscribers on AMC Plus if they like say, hey, like you know, you can get your after yeah, show. yeah. I mean, it, it would make sense if they if they did the after show live on AMC Plus and um. You know, use like you say, use that to bring in listeners. But if you ever notice, they don't actually put the show on AMC Plus until yeah. Thursday. Um, you can still get it. Like if you're, um, if you have cable, uh, you can get it that way. You know, on demand and whatnot. Yep. But um, if you if you don't have cable, you're basically if you want want to watch that on AM, AMC Plus and you didn't catch it night of, you know, you you basically got to wait until Thursday. Which yep. sucks. It, yeah, it sucks. Yeah, it's it seems very weird. Especially when this is we're at this point, you think that it's like they would be wanting to push everything they can to keep drawing more people in or just to keep the fan base going, but well, and the other thing too is, you know, when they when they did play it back to back, they would literally play them back to back. So you mm-hmm. would get The Walking Dead at nine, uh, Talking Dead at ten or ten fifteen or whenever the the episode ends. Right. But then Walking Dead, then Talking Dead, then Walking Dead, then Talking Dead. So you'd end up where you could see Talking Dead as many times as you could see Walking Dead in an evening. Well, now you're lucky if you can see it twice. Mm-hmm. You know, they'll play it at, you know, 11 o'clock. And then the next time you can see it is maybe at two in the morning or three in the morning, you know? So it's, uh, you you don't have as many chances to see it either. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And usually having, having to get up in the morning, my endurance is usually spent by midway through my second watch. So, well, to move on to other things, just briefly. We don't have any parrots. So, well, other than the parrot we had at the beginning of the episode. You know, I say he has that. that <laughs> nope. No parrot analytics. Uh, the only thing we had was the one we talked about the last time we were doing this. So hopefully one day we'll get some more parrots. And that brings us to the news and I don't have any news. I think I newsed out last night. <laughs> yeah. So we're recording this one after the other. Um, I did not see anything that caught, caught my eye. So. Nope. All right. Well, then. Well, LT, you want to tell people how to interact with us? I shall. Uh, we want to encourage you to follow us on Twitter and Instagram. That's at Walking Dead TTM. To submit your theories and feedback, most people post in our designated episode thread in our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash Walking Dead TTM. You can send us email. That's walkingdead at talkthroughmedia.com. You can also use our feedback form on the webpage. That's at talkthroughmedia.com slash feedback. If you'd like to leave us voicemail, Remember, you can call 216-232-6146. And all of our new episodes are on YouTube. Just search for Talk Through Media and remember to subscribe and click that bell to get notified when we have new videos. Those videos go out first before the podcast does. 
And to support us, like and review the Talk Through Media Facebook page. You can find that at facebook.com slash talkthroughmedia. And as always, the best way you can support us is in our Patreon. You can find that at patreon.com slash walkingdeadtalkthrough. And we would like to thank our Patreon supporters, Mike Rollo, Scott Kerr, Renee Murray, Dieta Patterson, that guy over there, Lawrence Todd. <laughs> Hello. And this guy, me, Kyle McAdams. Remember that Mike, Scott, Dieta, and Renee will be getting an early episode of a version of the episode this week. Uh, you can subscribe to us in Apple Podcasts or your podcast client of choice. And while you're there, give us a rating or review. You can also leave us a review at podchaser.com. There you can actually rate individual episodes or the whole podcast. And as always, remember to share our posts on Facebook and Twitter when we post them or tell a friend. Word of mouth is the best way to get us new listeners. All right. Well, what else can be listened on our network, Brian? Well, although it went out with a, a little bit of a problem. In other words, uh, you couldn't hear LT or me on the original <laughs> recording when I released it. Um, I finally did get an episode out uh, last night uh, of uh, the Star Trek Strange New Worlds talk through episode nine, covering the penultimate episode of the season. And uh, I believe one of the best episodes of the show to date. And uh, so. We've got that, and we've also got just, we're going to keep going on Lower Decks. We've got, once the I get the next episode of um, of Strange in the Worlds out, we're going to follow that right off with Lower Decks, and, uh, and then we should see, in a few weeks, we'll also start seeing uh, Prodigy episodes from... Um, yeah. Kim and, and James will be covering Star Trek Prodigy by Rebinge It uh, on, the, on the feed. And then we are expecting, so that'll be going, It we don't know if it'll be going for five weeks or 10 weeks. I'm thinking it's going to be 10 weeks this year. And this I'm, season. I'm betting on five. And we'll see. I it think, could be five and then five and then another five. Or I something think we're like going to do yeah. five in a Christmas break. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. Do five. Uh, any. Yeah. That do would. five. The Christmas break. Do the next last five, and then we'll roll right into Picard. Right. In, yeah. Yeah. So once we are covered, um, lower decks, then LT and me and whoever third co-host we can get, um, will cover the the episodes of Picard that we didn't cover which will segue right into season three of Picard. Mm -hmm. Yep. Nice. So, so that's it. And of course we have uh rebinge DS nine with um, James and Kim going as well. So yep. that's all on the all inclusive feed. Sounds good. All right. Well, our next episode of the walking dead season 11, episode 19 is titled variant. Hmm. Loki. <laughs> Written by Vivian Say and directed by Karen G Gavala. <laughs> Gaviola. Gaviola. <laughs> Description is Eugene is on the run. Mercer is tasked to find him. Aaron's group faces a complication on the road. Well, this is interesting. All right. So until next time, I'm Kyle. And I'm LT. And I'm Brian. And this is the Walking Dead Talk Through. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. <laughs>